Well, hello and welcome to the Figgy Art Museum's virtual program series. My name is Melissa Moore and I'm Director of Education at the Figgy, and we are happy you could join us tonight for this exciting program. For the immediate future, we're hosting these virtual programs most weeks, usually on Thursdays, but tonight is a very special night. So please check out the Figgy's website for up-to-date information on additional programs and what those dates are and also for registration options. So you know, next week we will celebrate the upcoming exhibition, Living Proof Exhibit, A Visualization of Hope. That'll be on Thursday, September 24th, and the program will begin at 6.30 p.m. Just like this week, after registering online, you'll receive a link to join the program of the day the program is scheduled. We're able to offer these Thursday programs and Tuesday program tonight at no cost to you, thanks to the generous sponsorship provided by Chris and Mary Rayburn. So Chris and Mary, we are so grateful for that. Thank you. Three quick Figgy updates. We are still recommending the visitors to the museum check out the timed visitor sessions online and reserve a spot. This is going to ensure that you have as much time as possible to enjoy the galleries since the sessions are time based and limited and we do clean and sanitize the museum in between each one. Um, update number two is that our cafe has reopened and we hope to see you there. It will be open from 11 until 2 Tuesday and through Saturday. For those of you who have been with us before and enjoyed the cafe, we have an all new menu and new chef and we are open that extra day on the Saturday. So again, we hope to see you there. The third update is that I'm sorry to share that you, with you that our beautiful elevator is still undergoing repairs and will be out of service for a wee bit longer. But as a reminder, we have a rather grand staircase and you are more than welcome to get your 10,000 steps in with us until the elevator is back up and running. So then two notes about the program this evening. Since this program is hosted in a webinar format, you can type any questions that you have for the presenter into the Q&A box or the chat box and we'll address them during the Q&A portion of tonight's program, which will come closer to the end. If you'd prefer to ask your question directly, please use the raise your hand function, which is in the participant area. And when we can, we'll give you the option to unmute your microphone and you can ask your question directly or make a comment. Also, I did want to mention that we are recording the session for archival purposes. All right, so at this time, it's my great pleasure to turn things over to Andrew Wallace. Andrew is the Figgy's Director of Collections and Exhibitions, and he's the curator of the magnificent show Magnetic West. He'll be introducing the program this evening. Andrew, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Melissa. It's a pleasure to be here, and I'm uh, very glad to see all of you who have been able to join us this evening. Um, this is a very special moment to have Wendy back, uh, Wendy Red Star back at the Figgy. Um, you may recall that she first came to the Figgy in 2015 and gave a wonderful talk um, discussing Native American identity in relation to the exhibition, Edward Curtis, 100 Masterworks. Um, one of the things I forgot to do, and I regret um, at our previous meeting, was take a moment to reflect on the tribes for whom this our region was once home, the Meskwaki, the Iowa, Ho-Chunk, and Sauk. Um, it's a, uh, it's a, that, that aspect of this exhibition is, um, is sort of the hidden part of the landscape that, as we look westward. Um, and it's something to keep in mind as we think about all the people who have um, been here and, and for whom this this land is home. Um, and of course, the West has also been associated with American identity um, for better and for worse. So uh, I think it's important that we take that moment to, to think about that. In 2015, the Figgy presented, as I said, Wendy Red Star's installation, Medicine Crow and the 1880 Crow Peace Delegation. It was an excellent um, installation and it provided important perspective uh, for those people who were going up to see Edward Curtis's work. Um, and as the person who was responsible for that installation, I was pretty, it was a sort of a bittersweet thing. While the images are beautiful, um, it was a very uncomfortable um, experience for me, but there was one image uh, in that exhibition, which I think um, sort of shined uh, above all others. And it was a picture of some Hopi women gathered on a housetop. And one of the women was turning back towards the camera with a little smile on her face, looking at back at Curtis. And it sort of destroyed the myth uh, that he was trying to create uh, by these perfectly composed images. And 
uh, it's not unusual for the subjects to be looking back at Curtis, but in this one, the smile, um, the, little, the little gleam sort of said it all. And um, instead of being a photograph about the past, it was a really contemporary photograph. And that was something that really struck, struck me about that ex exhibition and, and that particular work. And it sort of um, subverted uh, the idea that uh, Curtis was trying to, to put forward. Um, Wendy's artwork, of course, uh, provided us then, as it does now, much needed perspective on Crow Nation, uh, the Crow Nation through the use of de-romanticized and unironic uh, images of Crow people and Crow life in Montana. Most importantly, it shows them as being resilient, strong, creative, and present. And I think that's important for us. Um, and, and certainly this is an important aspect of, of several of the artists who are participating in this exhibition is to show just how present um, indigenous people are in American life now and how important they are to our history. So with that, I would like to introduce Wendy Redstar and um, welcome. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you, Melissa. I am. Um, I was scheduled originally to be out there in person, um, but of course, as we're all experiencing a uh, pandemic, I am just very grateful to be here virtually and have the opportunity to speak about my work and talk a little bit about the work that's in the current exhibition, Magnetic West. So um, with much appreciation, thank you to the figgy. Um, currently, I, you know, I'm based in Portland, Oregon, and we are on fire here. So I might do a little bit of coughing. It's uh, the air quality is terrible here. But I'm with that thought, I'm just sort of want to send everybody um, my well wishes and positivity, because I know we're all going through a tough time. So it's nice to be able to gather and connect. Um, uh, by doing things like this to uh, keep us um, keep us positive and um, connected. I'm going to share um, my screen here. So I grew up on the Crow Indian Reservation in Montana. It's located in South um, Eastern Montana near the Wyoming border and the largest city and actually the biggest city in Montana is uh, Bellings and we're very close to Bellings as well. This is a sign that um, you will see um, from Bellings to the reservation welcoming you into the reservation boundary. And um, I often will uh, drive from Portland, Oregon to the reservation and I, I always love and uh, never get tired of seeing this sign. So um, some works that I have in Magnetic West include this body of work called My Home is Where My Teepee Sits. And the concept around this uh, body of work, it's a series of five photos. And what I did was I, I went around my uh, reservation and just photographed, there are, there are um, seven towns located on my reservation. And so I just went around and photographed the common things that you would see if you were to drive around my reservation. And so with that, there are these various signs. And um, when you take a closer look at the signage, then you sort of get some clues about the people in the area. Um, maybe you even get an idea of like the federal government and sort of um, those kind of boundaries as well. Another aspect of the uh, reservation is uh, we have so many different types of religions. Um, and I think our oldest religion is the Catholic Church. And um, we have the First Baptist Church. And uh, Christianity was a, uh, one of the first presences for all indigenous people to enter into their communities. Uh, 
Um, another thing that you might see are these uh, res cars, which are um, these well-used broken down cars that I became very um, obsessed with and um, photographed, really wanting to know kind of the, the history of these of, of the history of these cars and how they ended up, um, you know, being placed where they where they where they were last sort of used, um, and they sort of live these other lives. Like uh, they become storage units. Um, or I had a friend who kept all his horse tack in his res car. Or they're um, they for for me personally were places where I would play with my cousins and we pretend to drive. Oops, I'm gonna shoot back here. Sorry about that. Another thing that you'll see are these uh, government houses that were, um, I think, built around the 70s. And architecturally, there are about maybe four different layouts, but they're all pretty much the same. Um, and the thing that I really enjoy about them is um, the paint colors. So it almost looks kind of like a Easter when you're driving through some of the different uh, neighborhoods. And then lastly, something that you'll see is you'll see these structures that are out in the landscape. And these are sweat lodges. Um, and sweat lodges uh, for the crow are places where um, you gather and you sweat and um, take a moment to cleanse your body and, and pray. And so you'll see these in the back of people's houses or usually located close to a river. Um, and they're, they're used as a way to uh, sort of just uh, kind of cleanse the body and renew yourself. So a precursor to that body of work, um, which some of those images are in Magnetic West, is a, a very important foundational work for myself um, that I produced when I was an undergrad at Montana State University in Bozeman. And so what you're looking at here is a map of Montana and it shows you um, the areas in which um, tribal nations occupied before contact and then after Montana has seven federally recognized tribes and the Crow Reservation is located here at the, uh, at the bottom. And this, this was my experience growing up, which um, is I think a uh, little over 2 million acres of territory. And so when I moved off the reservation to attend undergrad in Bozeman over in this area, um, I started taking Native American studies classes. And that was the first time that I started to understand about um, basically the different terminology that I grew up hearing all the time, for instance, reservation. Like I, I grew up on a reservation, but I didn't quite understand why we were on the reservation or uh, terms like allotment. And so um, with that, I became very interested in uh, learning more about my, um, community's history and our history with the US government. And so when I was doing that research, um, I actually learned through this, uh, finding an image of this man, his name is sits in the middle of the land, and he was responsible for telling the US government during the Fort Laramie Treaty in the mid 1800s where Crow territory was. And he used this beautiful quote. He said, my home is where my teepee sits. And he used this beautiful metaphor of the way that we set up a teepee, which is we use four foundational poles. Um, and then we set up the rest of the poles on those foundational poles and then the, the um, cover for the teepee. But what he said was, my home is where my teepee sits. And then he took those four poles and he placed them around the major migration routes that we took throughout the season. Sorry that it's jumping around. Um, and so that mapped out 38.5 million acres. And I was just in awe of um, that way of 
um, placing our, our, our land and our territory within sort of the structure of our home, our, you know, our literal home. And when I took a closer look, I realized that uh, where I was going to undergrad was Crow Country. And I wanted to, I wanted to celebrate that. Um, I wanted to let the, the Bozeman community know that we were on Crow territory. And I also wanted to acknowledge my ancestors. So I asked my father if he would help me and my mother to harvest some lodge poles from our reservation and then um, take them to campus. And I would set them up around um, on the land of the university in homage of um, my ancestors. So this is an um, example I wanted to start out with to show you how we set up an actual crow style TV, which is the four foundation poles. Then you have um, all the rest of the poles set up on those foundation poles and then the, the final cover. And I always like to point out um, aesthetically crows um, love uh, an hourglass shape. So the goal is to harvest the longest lodge poles, the skinniest lodge poles, to create um, a length that is uh, long enough that it looks like an hourglass when you're finished. So then I spent um, several weeks after that uh, placing different uh, TP uh, installations up around campus and I would either uh, grab friends to help me or sometimes my parents would come and uh, help me set up these various installations. And this one happens to be right behind the architecture building and near this co-ed dorm. And um, this particular piece, I took me eight hours to set up. So it was a long day. And then um, I went home and I came back the next day and then all of the teepees were knocked down. And I thought, well, it could have been, you know, something very innocent, like the wind. So I set them back up again and then came back and they were knocked down again. So then I was like, well, okay, why don't I like take all the poles and make this one massive teepee and then see what happens, see if whomever is knocking these down uh, can knock that down. And I came and they were knocked down. So then I just decided, well, screw it and I put it up on the football field. <laughs> so here it is um, in its final form on the 50 yard line and I thought this was a perfect ending um, considering that this piece of land, these, uh, you know, the foot for territory and American culture that um, I thought this is where this piece could speak the loudest. And so I um, consider this to be a, a foundational piece because it really speaks to the way that I continue to work wherein I'll, um, I'll do some research or I'll dig into an image that sort of sweat, sets off some questioning. And then from there, I will um, then uh, create a project based on what I've discovered within that research. Uh, I believe during 2016, I had a solo exhibition at the Q Foundation, which is located in New York City. And I decided for this exhibition, I wanted to focus on this event that, I, that happens on my reservation called Crow Fair. And it's been happening since 1904. Um, I believe in 2018, we had the 100th Crow Fair and it's open to the public, but originally it was started by the US government as a way to get uh, the Crow community to uh, assimilate into um, settler culture and farm. And so they modeled it after the Midwest fairs. I very much think of Iowa as maybe one of those fairs that it was modeled after. And the hope was that the Crows would then um, bring their, their harvest, their um, animals, and they would create prizes um, for their efforts. But also knowing that the crows weren't really going to be that interested in it to help entice them, they lifted some of the bans that happened um, to all Native people at that time, which was anything that had to do with um, any, anything cultural, like um, dancing, 
um, anything like that. And so they lifted some of those restrictions. And what the Crows introduced to the fair was a parade where, um, and we still do this today, where we wear our finest outfits and we um, parade around the encampment. And so Crow Fair, um, when it happens, it's every third week in, of August and it's known as the teepee capital of the world. So every Crow family sets up a camp and then um, the parade happens in the morning where we wear our finest, um, ride horses or decorate our cars as floats and go around the encampment. There's also a powwow that happens and then there's a rodeo attached to it. And then sometimes there's some random elements that I think still harken back to that fair. So I decided what I wanted to do is mine the archives and look into the decades of Crow Fair and see if I could find um, as many images throughout the decades and create this timeline. So what you're seeing here is these little cutouts um, of photographs that I found in actually my family's uh, collection, my own personal collection, and then um, some of the archives. I'm gonna play just a tiny little bit of this video um, to just kind of give you a little bit of an idea. So I started my timeline in 2017 and these are actually uh, all of my own photos. A lot of these were taken from um, my iPhone. And then um, what I did was I would write directly on the wall if I came to an image that I wanted to explain something that was either happening or something that was um, being worn, or if there was like an individual person in uh, the timeline that I wanted to talk about. And I tried to name as many people as possible. Um, I'm going to pause right here. And um, for instance, there is this woman named Winona Plenty Hoops who, who has passed away. Uh, but she was really important um, for me to include because she's of the generation of my grandparents. And she dresses this old style crow, which is the women would uh, make their own uh, dresses. They would wear these uh, leather high top moccasins. Oftentimes, I'm sorry, they would wear belts um, and they would also uh, wear scarves. And so she was sort of the last of that generation to dress that way. And now when I go back to the reservation, I don't really see that. Um, I'm just gonna show some details of the timeline. But the great thing about um, that image as well is actually Winona shows up again as a young child in um, the 1910s. So it was fun to see um, various people kind of pop up in the timeline again. So for instance, this is my grandmother and this is in the 1920s. Any information I, I could put down, I would, including names of horses. And then the other thing that you'll notice is like the color technology. So the timeline starts uh, out in, you know, color um, from when I was taking photos to then it goes into, you know, black and white or sepia tone. And the other thing to think about is all, all the color photos are coming from Crow photographers. Um, like for instance, my dad, there's a bunch of his slides that are in the timeline or from um, my aunts. And to transition over into the black and white, many of those photos are taken by white photographers. Um, but we do happen to have an, a photographer named Richard Thrussell who was half Cree and half Scottish, um, who we actually adopted into our tribe, who took several amazing photos. And then um, also with the timeline, I, you know, I have it starting with my daughter because she's the next generation to carry this, um, this history forward. I want to show you what the actual Crow Fair looks like. So this is the, um, my family's camp. It's known as the Old Man Eagle Camp, which is my grandfather's Crow name. You might have noticed um, on the dresses, the women look like they're wearing polka dots. And um, 
those are actually elk teeth or ref reference elk teeth. So our the crow traditional dress is made out of this beautiful wool tray cloth and then adorned with um, the eye teeth of an elk. So there's only um, two eye teeth per elk. And a good elk tooth dress would have uh, up to five, well, I'm saying good, this is in my opinion, but um, 500, uh, 500 elk teeth. So you're looking at a lot of elk um, to make one dress. And basically what the dress is saying is um, the status of, um, of that person or that family of the, men, the hunting abilities of the men in the family or the trading abilities. And nowadays, most of the teeth are made uh, synthetically. So these are all synthetic. And you might, if you happen to go into a museum that has a Native American collection, you might, here's my daughter wearing an elk tooth dress. Um, you might read on the label that the dress says wool, wood or bone and um, beads or glass beads. And the wood or the bone is referring to carved imitation elk teeth. Um, so this is our family's parade float. Here it is in action. And then I just wanted to play this video here to um, give you kind of a sense of what it looks like in context. Oh, as a Andrew mentioned, uh, I had a ex solo exhibition in 2015 at the Figgy called Medicine Crow and the 1880 Crow Peace Delegation, which originally started at um, the Portland Art Museum in 2014. And so it was wonderful to have it travel and it traveled for about a couple years. And it was based off of this image of uh, Medicine Crow, well, actually two, two images, this image and this image in Medicine Crow is a crow chief of ours, of our community. And he was known as like a visionary. He had a lot of um, visions of things to come. Like for instance, uh, he had a vision of the railroad. He also had a vision of um, settlers coming into our territory. And the thing about this image is that ever since I left the Crow Reservation, I kept running into these two images and they've sort of followed me around and continue to follow me around um, where, um, where, whatever city I happen to be in, I, might, I, I tend to encounter these images. Um, for instance, at the airport, I ran into uh, this book with uh, that same image on it. Um, when I was at UCLA in graduate school, uh, I used to go and get on his tea and just because uh, his image was on it as well. So uh, when I was asked to have a solo exhibition in 2014 at the Portland Art Museum, there was a, a lot of conversation going around and it's not a new conversation, but it seemed to spike up about cultural appropriation, especially pertaining to native images. And I started thinking about like, how is that prevalent to me and my community? Um, and how, where do I connect um, that, seeing that happening? And I immediately thought of these images of Medicine Crow. So for instance, if you were to Google Medicine Crow, um, you would find that there are a lot of artists who are also making drawings of him. You also find one of his descendants named Joseph Medicine Crow, who has passed away and he was a anthropologist and a historian of our tribe. He also received a medal from Barack Obama. So you'll see him there as well. And so I, I decided I wanted to like go back to those two images and actually sit down and investigate them. I've never asked myself, well, what happened that day when he took that photo? 
And when I did that, I learned that it um, wasn't just Medicine Crow um, who had his photo taken in 1880 by a photographer named Charles Milton Bell, but um, also five other chiefs were included in um, getting their portraits taken. And they had traveled from uh, Montana to Washington, D.C. to fight for our territory because the U.S. government was trying to put a, a train through a large chunk of our hunting territory, which eventually did end up happening. So now when I like look at that photo, I think of it, I think of it as that, as sort of um, a, really standing up and fighting for the Crow community, our la language, our land, our culture, um, all sort of uh, is what I think of when I look at these images. So <clears throat> knowing that, then I started looking into the, um, the archives and looking into this trip. And what I learned is that Medicine Crow um, documented it through these amazing ledger drawings when he returned. So they were in Washington, D.C. for about two months. And when he returned, um, a, a clerk that worked for the U.S. government, um, that worked for the Crow tribe, asked Medicine Crow if he would draw the trip from memory. So there's these amazing um, ledger drawings here. This is the capital. Um, here are some uh, three different styles of boats. Also three different types of trains. And these uh, ledger drawings are um, housed at Montana State University in Billings. Another thing I looked into was uh, what the chiefs were trying to articulate through their clothing. And basically what they were telling you is how they attained um, chief status or the jecha, which is uh, the Crow word for um, chief or the literal translation being good man. And um, in order to reach that status, there are these four things they needed to do that needed to be witnessed. So be the first in battle to touch an enemy warrior, snatching a weapon from an enemy in hand-to-hand -hand combat, stealing a horse from within an enemy camp, and leading a successful war party. And the way that those uh, different honors are illustrated or articulated through their clothing happen to be the ermine that are on their shirts represent that they uh, captured a weapon. If they have ermine on their leggings, it meant that they stole a horse with an enemy camp. The various feathers that they wear meant that they touched an enemy in battle or led a successful war party. So this is an image of Old Crow. And then from there, um, I decided I wanted to trace the outlines of their outfits and then also investigate each of these men and provide details on their personal lives, um, any, any sort of records I could look at, like the census records, or maybe it was like just general gossip that I've heard growing up on the reservation. I also included um, their crow name, if I could find it. This is Pretty Eagle. And Pretty Eagle, he had a, a sad story in the end. When he died, he was buried in the back of a wagon box. And um, late, uh, later on, his remains were stolen along with several other tribal members' remains and then sold. And his remains ended up in the Natural History Museum, the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. And they were there for about 72 years. And then the Crow tribe was able to get his remains back. And there's a place at our reservation called Pretty Eagle Point where there's a teepee, uh, like a bronze teepee structure. Um, and that's where he's buried. And I didn't know that. I, I knew about Pretty Eagle Point, but I did not know that until I actually started doing the research on this project. This is Two Belly. And uh, he's wearing this amazing uh, floral beaded jacket with otter fur trim. Um, and these were very popular 
during that time period and they were modeled after um, like Western military jackets. And when I was at the Portland Art Museum, I actually uh, found a similar crow style jacket that they had in their collection. So here's an example of that. And that gives you a really great idea of what that would look like in color in the vibrancy. So um, I included that in the exhibition. So you can see it here and then standing in the background, you can see Two Belly, two belly wearing it, wearing his version. This is Chief Plenty Koo. There's an interesting connection here for me personally. I, um, Chief Plenty Koo actually has a state park. Um, it's one of the only state parks on a reservation in Montana. And he um, donated his allotment to the state of Montana to preserve as a park where people could come and learn about crow culture. And the interesting connection to this uh, delegation trip in 1880 was that um, they took that delegation to Mount Vernon because they had time. They were there for two months. And so they sort of set them up with various things to do. And one of those things was to go to Washington's estate. And he was um, so sort of um, like awestruck by the concept of uh, Mount Vernon that he wanted to build a miniature Mount Vernon on the reservation. And that's what Chief Plenty Coup State Park is. So it, it has his log cabin, his, um, he's buried there. There's a visitor center that also has a lot of his personal um, artifacts, including a lot of tribal artifacts as well. So I love knowing that this is uh, an interesting, this interesting connection that came through this project. And then we're back to medicine crow. So not, so that was an, another interesting thing. You know, I've just been used to seeing those two images and then to find out that there, there was at least four or five different images. And so um, here's a different angle of medicine crow. I like to point out that he is wearing these hair extensions, which a lot of crow men did wear because hair um, and having long hair equals power. Um, <clears throat> and then the other thing I like to point out is that he's got a hair bow and it's broken here and um, it should look like this. And that in order to wear a hair bow, that meant that he had to overcome an enemy and slice their throats. Again, touching back at um, Charles H. Barst Barstow, the clerk for the government, um, he's a government agent for the Crow Reservation. Um, he had this practice of when crows would come um, to visit him for government business, um, he would provide them paper. And so he's got not only medicine crows drawings, but um, several other ledger drawings. And, and included in that are these amazing drawings of the circus. So the delegation also got to see a circus. And one of my um, things that I, I like to point out is that a lot of these animals don't exist in crow country. So he also came up with names for them. So for instance, the peacock is wonder tail comes from above. And here's some other examples. And of course we have uh, um, catfish in their territory. And uh, the writing is um, the clerk's writing. And I really, um, I became obsessed with these drawings and wanted to figure out a way that I could make them mine or make them real. And there was this advertisement on social media at the time uh, where you could take a drawing and then turn it into a soft toy. So I thought, why don't I try that? So I sent in this uh, um, elk with a big back on him or a camel to the company and this is what came back. Um, and I like that. So I thought, why don't I <laughs> try it again? And so here is a big snake with legs. 
course, we have mountain lions, so he referred to this as a mountain lion, the lion. And a um, man dog or monkey, one of my favorites. And this is a great um, sort of illustration of um, sort of the incredible amount of detail that he provided in all his uh, images from memory. But this is like a great example of him sort of forgetting and he provided the um, zebra with dots instead of stripes. So this is the last one I did. And then out of this exhibition, I'm also a mother. I have an amazing 13 year old, but at the time this exhibition was happening, she was seven years old and I um, was working full time and also um, fostering my art career and trying to um, fit in art making wherever I could. So one night I was working on these uh, delegation portraits and I happened to have a ton of Xeroxes as well so I could make mistakes on those. And she came up to me and she um, wanted to play and I said, well, I have to finish that, uh, finish working on this project, but um, here's a stack of these uh, photos and you can do whatever you want with them. And I sort of forgot about it. And then she came back and plopped this image of Medicine Crow onto my desk. And I thought this is, um, this is exactly what I needed. I needed one more piece to kind of round up the show. And um, this, this was the piece that I needed because it really is about the, the next generation and them holding that knowledge and carrying it forward. So I asked her if she would like to make more of these drawings and um, be included in the exhibition. So here she is, I set her up with a little studio. And then she made about 20 of these drawings. And then on the way to the opening, she asked if she could talk about her work. And I said, <laughs> it was, although it was scary because kids are very transparent. Um, I said, yes, of course. Um, I can't have myself talk about my work and not have you talk about your work. So here she is talking about her work. And um, this is when I learned that she has this gift of public speaking. And I had been separating sort of my uh, being a mother from my art practice. And um, this is when I learned that I didn't have to do that. And I don't know why I was doing that. And this is something that we could foster. And so from there, we started our collaborative um, practice. And this um, first sort of iteration of it was her giving a tour to her own class of this exhibition. Uh, we've also um, had a, a, some work in a group exhibition, which also includes two of the artists in Magnetic West, Zig Jackson and Will Wilson. The show was called Contemporary Native Photographers and the Edward Curtis Legacy at the Portland Art Museum. And we created uh, a series of four images called Absaliga Feminist. Edward Curtis came to the Crow Reservation in the early 1900s and photographed a lot of my community. and. A lot of um, the portfolio images, I, yeah, I think solely just the portfolio images were mostly men. Um, and so I wanted to do an updated portrait showcasing uh, Crow women because we are actually a matrilineal society. We have clans and um, um, the lines are matrilineal. And then the other thing I wanted to show was um, the vibrancy. Uh, if Curtis had color technology, um, this is what you would see. Uh, so I wanted to show that as well. So this is actually B giving another tour here. Um, and she did, um, this was uh, the, the, um, in 2016, so a couple years later, and she gave a, a tour to her class as well. And then from there, we did a residency at the Denver Art Museum. And for this, she wanted to design her own tour uh, based off of the collections that are there at the Denver Art Museum. 
So we brought her in and we set her up exactly like a tour guide. And so she got a little badge. Um, she got full access to um, the museum and to the artwork. And um, she, would, she selected artwork and we would give her um, or provide her with um, information by either a curator or a, another docent. And she became so interested in this uh, concept and invested in it that she wanted a tour guide outfit. So she designed a little outfit, here's the drawing. And then I sewed that up for her. And here she is giving tours. She gave three 30 minute tours of the native collection and also the Western art collection. And then she also provided some activities at the end. It was a really wonderful experience. Um, during this residency, I also created another body of work. I'm going to go over this called the Accession Series because um, the Denver Art Museum in their native collection, they have a very large collection of curl objects. And during the Works Pro Progress Administration, the museum hired artists to come in and to make watercolor drawings of the African and the native collection for their um, catalog cards for each object. Um, and I found out about these and they're beautiful. So what you're looking at, um, you're looking at an image of my father and my daughter and our horse Bubba, but behind that is actually what the original catalog card uh, looks like of one of the curl objects, which is a wedding blanket in the Denver Art Museum collection. So I asked the museum if they would be okay if I uh, obtained copies and then paired them, um, paired the objects with, uh, modern day parade riders at Crow Fair to tell, to show you um, the context and how these objects are actually being utilized by the community. So here's a wedding blanket and then this is Beatrice with the wedding blanket draped over her lap. Um, this is actually great sort of um, image because it's a, actually a beaded belt, but this, uh, I found this parade rider here, and he's actually using a beaded belt as his horse collar, but they're so uncannily uh, similar that I paired them together. <clears throat> the men wear these beautiful beaded cuffs, so this is a cuff, and here, here's the cuff. So you sort of have to like really look into the images and find them. And this is a beaded saddle bag, and here it is on this parade rider. Um, another collaboration that I did with Beatrice was we went to the Tang Teaching Museum and this one I decided I would have her sort of be, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like I've mentor her um, to create uh, a version of the Four Seasons. So mentor her through this process. So I created this work called the Four Seasons in 2006 when I was a graduate student at UCLA. And um, they were based off this experience I had when I went to the Natural History Museum specifically searching for curl objects. Um, I was feeling actually quite homesick. Um, and I immediately thought like, oh, I bet I could find some curl objects if I went to the Natural History Museum. And that's, um, that's reality. That's actually reality. So I did, I found some curl moccasins there, but the way that that museum was set up, you had to walk through the dinosaur exhibit um, to then uh, enter into the native galleries. So you really got this feeling like this, all of this stuff in this museum was not living. And so I wanted to create a body of work that was talking about like this experience that I had, the way that an institution displays native people and objects. And so Beatrice, uh, basically, I had her, um, you know, buy all the things, sort of all the ingredients to create her own season and we set it up at the Tang Museum. Here she is <laughs> us finishing it. And then this one actually was like a flip on it where we invited museum goers to come in and be photographed by Beatrice, giving her the agency. So this is Beatrice uh, last year, the beginning of last year, and she is retired now. 
So our collaborative practice ended um, at the Pulitzer Art Museum. And so this is our, our, her last tour, and she gave a tour of their exhibits, Ruth Asawa. And here she is. And so it was just like a, um, such a great experience to work with my daughter, um, but also equally wonderful for her, re for her um, ability to tell me like, we're done <laughs> and to retire. retire. Um, because she wants to uh, invest her time in becoming herself. And um, so it's just like a, a to me, I learned so much through our uh, collaboration and our experience and our time together um, that it was just really fruitful and amazing for me um, to have that experience with her. And I'm gonna go ahead and end on that note. Well, thank you, Wendy. That was wonderful. It was great to see the continuity uh, in your work with the other work that's um, included in the exhibition. One of the things that's, there's a nice photograph that's uh, by Zig Jackson of, um, I think it's called Crow Song. It's Thomas Yellowtail um, at the Crow, Crow Fair. And it wow. sort of picks up on what um, you were discussing, which I think is, is fantastic. So thank you for that. Yeah, it's great. It, I love all the connecting points. That's what I always um, sort of keeps me um, kind of obsessively searching to connect all those like threads. Well, Wendy, are you still okay with taking any questions our audience members might have? Yes. Yes. Wonderful. Thank you for that. And thank you so much for sharing with us tonight. Uh, we did have a question come it might have just come to me. Uh, what's up next for you in your practice? Is there anything you're especially looking forward to? Or is it all secret and we have to stay tuned? So it's not all secret. Actually, something just came out um, uh, last week. I edited this uh, issue for Aperture. It's issue 240 called Native America, um, focusing on uh, Native artists who are either photographers or use photography in their practice. So um, that's just recent, and I'm actually doing an introduction to it on Thursday through Aperture. So keep a lookout for that. Um, a, lo a lot of my stuff was postponed or um, canceled, and... Um, but one of the things that got postponed, I'm very excited about, it's scheduled for um, January of 2021 with the Jocelyn Museum. And it's a project, it's another research project that's focused on the photographers of Frank Reinhardt. And um, he photographed uh, the Indian Congress of uh, 1898, which happened in conjunction with the Trans Mississippi Exposition that Omaha Nebraska um, had and the Jocelyn Museum is in Omaha. So I'm very excited to uh, work on that. There's 500 images. I think there was, um, yeah, over 500 native people gathered including, and including in that were some Crow tribal members. Oh, well, we'll have to definitely stay tuned for that as you move forward. We did have another question, actually a raised hand here from Dr. Randy Lewis. So I'm gonna go ahead, Randy, and allow you to talk. You just have to unmute your microphone now. There you go. Uh, actually, the question is for me, Melissa. Ah, Linda, Linda. yes. <laughs> Sorry, Linda. And uh, I, uh, I remember well when Wendy came to the Figgy, in fact, we chatted afterwards and I shared with her that I was a Canadian from Northern Ontario and grew up in, um, what is now called Thunder Bay, where uh, close to half of the population now, or soon will be um, indigenous uh, Ojibwe. Um, that aside, I, I wonder if you could comment, this is a very broad area obviously, but as an artist working with uh, concepts of, of indigenous people and particularly the Crow, 
what do you, how would you summarize the biggest uh, misconception perhaps that we honkies, we white uh, <laughs> European settlers, uh, descendant of, have of the Native American population now today? No, I, I thank you. And I actually, I do remember, uh, especially Thunder Bay. It's so interesting. There's actually a great, um, a great podcast about Thunder Bay and the issue that they have with finding murdered indigenous people in the river that I think runs through Thunder Bay. Um, I highly recommend it. It's very good. Um, but I would say like with any minority, I think, with native people, it's the de dehumanizing. So that sort of idea that um, like you can't relate to them um, or because we've been so dehumanized. And I think that's what, like in the work 1880 um, is sort of me trying to put back that human aspect, that relatable aspect of them, that they were human and they did extraordinary things, but they also did some um, you know, they also had their flaws and um, they were humorous um, and they lived lives that uh, are very much relatable to, to everyone. So I think that's the biggest misconcept, just like the dehumanizing. dehumanizing. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Linda, and hi, Randy, also, and thank you, Wendy. We do, um, I'm going to go ahead and mute you again, but just raise that hand up if you have anything else you want to add later. Um, all right, so then we do have a question here, Wendy. If you are in the photo, who's actually taking the picture? Um, I, it's so funny, especially in um, the, the image of Beatrice and I, because we did that um, with a self timer. And I thought I had wised up enough with a remote, um, but the remote ran out of batteries. So that, that one was quite hilarious because I only had a 10 second self timer. So it was me frantically running to the couch and fixing things and then posing. Um, so, so the outtakes of that session are pretty hilarious. So yeah, a lot of um, self timer. That's great. I bet you have some really interesting ones there. <laughs> um, let's see here. So uh, another question. You mentioned that you were very intentional and have a very specific approach to investigating and revealing connections between people, events, and the products of your practice. Is this a structure you recommend, encourage, or share in a structured way with other artists, or do you believe that each person must find their own way? I think each person must find their own way. This is just the way that makes sense to me in my like creative mode or output. It's always been, um, I've always been super curious. I've always sort of asked a million questions and it's just sort of worked out that um, the way that I feel like my voice is the strongest is through sort of the visual research and outputting things visually through my research. And I feel like that's similar to the message you shared. I can't believe it's been five years ago now when you were at the Figgy with the Creative Arts Academy students. So thank you for, for continuing to share that message. And also um, just another thank you looking back to that, that beautiful afternoon with those students. I know they really appreciated it. Thank you. All right, we do have a comment here from Georgia. Your daughter is quite remarkable. Your work is amazing. And she's honored to hear your story. Georgia, I hope you don't mind that I shared your words there because I have a feeling that everyone who's been in our audience tonight shares them as well. So I wanted to just raise those. Wendy, on behalf of all of our participants, I want to say thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Now we do have um, a, another way for you to ask any burning questions that may come to you. Of course, they'll come to you as soon as we end the program this evening. If that <laughs> happens, uh, fear not. You all should have my email address. Again, it's Melissa Moore. Um, I'm the one who sent you the link tonight. So if you do have any of those questions you just can't live without having answered, send them and Andrew and I will make sure that Wendy gets those and we'll get an answer to you um, as we can. So with this, I believe we're ready to end the formal part of our program. Andrew, any, any final words from you? 
Thank you very much, Wendy, for taking the time to be with us. We're so sad that you couldn't come all the way to Iowa, but very happy that you're here. And um, I think we all think of you as a great friend to the Figgy. Um, we're certainly grateful um, for you having you twice. And then, of course, being able to include your work in the collection, I think, is really great. So thank you for that. And thank everybody else for attending tonight. We really appreciate you being here to listen to Wendy speak about her work. Thank, thank you. It was an honor. It's an honor to have my work not only exhibited, but also in the collection. Thank you for the support. Um, just for our audience members who haven't had a chance yet to see Wendy's pieces that are on display, I know many of you have seen Magnetic West and, and we appreciate all of your positive feedback and your wonderfully kind remarks on that. But for those of you who haven't yet, it's going to be on display through, or I'm sorry, October 4th. What month is it? October 4th. And for those of you who plan to visit the museum in person, please remember to check out the Figgy's website. We do have updated information on those museum hours, which include the visitor sessions I mentioned earlier and that's what we recommend you do through advanced registration. You're also going to learn about our current policies and procedures for visiting the museum. Um, of course you are also welcome to walk up. We do take walk-ups at the museum but just uh, either way you come we hope that you enjoy. Thank you all again for joining us. Wendy, thank you. Andrew, thank you. It's a pleasure as always. We look forward to seeing our participants at programs. Everyone thanks again and have a wonderful night. Good night. Thank, Thank you. you.